Thank you, Pastor Key, and thanks for the invitation to come to Northwest Iowa and to speak at your Reformation Day celebration. I count it a privilege and am grateful that you extended the invitation to me. Worship of God, the highest and the holiest activity that a man can be involved in. We have been made to worship God. Our salvation has as its highest aim the worship of God, the worship of him now on earth, and the worship of him someday in the perfection of eternal life and glory when we will join the saints who have gone before and the hosts of the holy angels and we will spend eternity in the worship of God. This was the purpose of the death of Jesus Christ. Christ died for the elect and for the elect alone. He died for them and needed to die for them because they were sinners, sinners who had no right to stand in the presence of God, sinners who had no right to worship God by his death. He earned for us the right, the precious right, to approach God in worship. A way has been opened up to us, a blood-sprinkled way. When you come to church Sunday morning and open the door to the sanctuary, think of it, that Jesus Christ died so that you could worship God. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He does not only regenerate us and work faith in our hearts, uniting us to Jesus Christ and to his body the church, but he works in our hearts the desire to worship God. He works in us in such a way that our response to the call of God, seek ye my face, is a response gladly made from the depths of our hearts Thy face, Lord, will I seek. The Reformation and the Reformers were vitally interested in the matter of worship. Proper worship. God-pleasing worship. The whole Reformation may be characterized as the work of God through the reformers to bring the church back to the right worship of God. The worship of the Roman Catholic Church had become false and blasphemous, idolatrous worship. God was not worshipped anymore there as he wills to be worshipped. The worship of the church did not please God. That worship did not carry away his blessing, but it incurred, as so much worship does today, the wrath and the judgment of God. The reformers reacted against Rome's false worship 
and the reformers endeavored to return the church to proper biblical worship. This was a concern to all of the reformers, every one of them, to a man. But this was especially a concern of John Kelvin. And among the most enduring accomplishments under the grace of God that Kelvin made to the church were the accomplishments that he made in the area of worship, the public worship of God. For so much of what you see tonight in this church building, for so much of the service that you will participate in Sunday morning and again Sunday afternoon or evening, you are indebted to the reformer John Kelvin. In this year, in which we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the birth of Kelvin, it is fitting that we consider together his work on behalf of the public worship of the church. Let's do that together tonight. I direct your attention to the topic that has been advertised and announced Kelvin's Reformation of Public Worship. The worship of the church at the time of the Reformation was in great need of restoration. Kelvin complains in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. I will sprinkle my speech tonight with quotations from some of the writings of Kelvin. Kelvin complains in his Institutes, the great systematic theology of the Reformation, with these words, the worship of God has been deformed by a diverse and unbearable mass of superstitions, doctrine apart from which Christianity cannot stand, has been entirely buried and driven out. Public assemblies have become schools of idolatry and ungodliness. In his great defense of the Reformation, in his reply to the letter of Cardinal Sadelet, Kelvin wrote this. Meanwhile, impiety so stalked abroad and almost no doctrine of religion was pure from admixture, no ceremony free from error, no part, however minute, of the divine worship of God untarnished by superstition. And in his treatise entitled The Necessity of Reforming the Church, Kelvin wrote, I come now to ceremonies which, while they ought to be grave attestations of divine worship, are rather a mere mockery of God. A new Judaism as a substitute for that which God had distinctly abrogated has again been reared up by means of numerous puerile extravagances collected from different quarters, and with these have been mixed up certain impious rites, partly borrowed from the heathen, and more adapted to some theatrical show than to the dignity of the worship of God. And again in that same treatise, Kelvin wrote, when God is worshiped in images when fictitious worship is instituted in his name, when supplication is made to the images of saints, and divine honor 